This episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Truck and Tap. Food trucks and craft beer in Woodstock, Decatur, and Alpharetta, Georgia. Visit truckandtap.com to see the lineup of food trucks and what's on tap. Wild and sour beers continue to evolve and grow in popularity, from simple sours like Berliner Weiss and Goza to complex, spontaneously fermented Lambic and Goose. There's a huge variety in these beer styles. We're joined this week by Jason Pellet from Orpheus Brewing and Nick Burgoyne of Sweetwater's Woodlands to talk wild and sour ales. We'll profile several styles, talk about the process of making these beers, and the challenges for American brewers in naming beers while respecting Belgian traditions. We had lots to talk about this week, and we couldn't fit it all in the regular show. Podcast listeners get an extra fifth segment, so be sure to stick around after the show and listen in. We hope you enjoy. a tab grab a seat and pour a pint it's time for the beer guys radio show you want free beer go to the brewery dedicated to the art science and enjoyment of craft beer yeah what's wrong with the beer we got now here are your hosts tim dennis and brian hewitt and welcome to the beer guys radio show we are radio for the local craft beer movement this week we're on the road we're at zcon at their brewery night at sweetwater brewing i'm tim dennis and i'm brian hewitt like tim mentioned we are here at zcon's brewery night and we're going to talk to the z car club association president chris carl a little later in the show then you know we'll discuss the club and the convention but don't worry beer fans we've got plenty of beer to talk about too we're talking all things sour and wild this week with nick burgoyne and jason pellet now brian nick is the lead brewer and blender here at Sweetwater's Woodlands, where they focus on wild, sour, and barrel-aged beers, such as Cambium, which we have a bottle of to enjoy today. And that is a a recent winner of a medal at the U.S. Open Beer Championship, a silver medal winner. Yes, it it, it deserves it. And Jason Pellet is the president and brewmaster of Orpheus Brewing, where they brew a variety of beer styles, but they include a number of sour and wild offerings. Orpheus just brought home a bronze medal from the Great American American Beer Fest for their I Am Only memories, and that's delightful, and it's deserving, in uh, the Lambic Style Ale category. Guys, thanks for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. How's things at Nick? You you barely made it to us today. You had a beer emergency today, right? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, just uh, working happen. on the brewery. Got to get things done, <laughs> absolutely. Situation <so>. normal. <laughs> right? Uh, other than uh, emergency off. day here, uh, how's uh, how's your week going? Anything interesting oh. this week? I mean, I got a lot going on. Uh, I'm doing a pilot batch for a future uh, possible brew. Um was uh, got a bottling run tomorrow for Woodland Circle, um, and yeah, just a whole lot going on this week. Now the Woodland Circle is your membership club, correct? For special, unique beers, and uh, getting ready to start a new series on that this uh, fall. Correct? Yeah, we are. Um, it's currently you can sign up now, but uh, I think we'll be dropping the first bottles around uh, December, so just in time for the holidays. Looking forward to that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Jason, how about you? What have you been up to this week? Oh, uh, let's see. Today. Had barley wine barrel tasting for a while and had to run to the gym and then go back and finish the tasting and then come <laughs> over here. So that was a rough gym session. I was going to say, does but that it's help? Yeah. Well, Not it's good all. that he at least put the gym in there because you could have just went straight barley wine uh, what, all was the it, way through. Was it J-I-M or G-Y-M? I'm curious about that. It is G-Y-M. Okay, just making sure. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Moving right along here, Brian. So we had a busy week, again, as usual on that. We had uh, some fun on our quest to visit every brewery in the yes. state of Georgia. We ticked a few more off. We're at number, we're at 67 now. Yes, that sounds I believe. right. And, uh, and we've got about 18 more, I think, to visit this year. And we have plans to get to them all. We should do this. I think we're going to make it. We can accomplish this. But we went up to Blue Ridge, Georgia. Yes. We visited Grumpy Old Men Brewing up there, Fanning Brewing Company, and Blue Ridge Brewery. And uh, good time chatting with the folks at Grumpy Old Men and Fanning. Unfortunately, Blue Ridge uh, was a full house there, absolutely packed. So that was a little quick in and out. Uh, But went up there and had a good time. Grumpy Old Men let us sample a white chocolate wheat ale yes. that I enjoyed quite a lot. I really like that, and I really want, because I want to ruin everything with coffee, I really want that with coffee in it. That, you know, I really got, good. 
I know that you want to put coffee in every single beer, but I have to agree with you. That, that would be pretty nice. It I would think, be awesome. Uh, absolutely. So other than that, Brian, what'd you get into this week? Well, I went over and checked out a uh, Wild Leap Tap takeover at a place in uh, Brookhaven, Georgia here and had their Alpha Abstraction Volume 3. And wow, that's that's really good. I've heard good things. It's extremely yeah. good. And I also tried their Rolling Deep Cinnamon Roll Stout. And I think that's good. And the consensus I was looking at online was that people think it's a little on the thin side. I'm like, I kind of get that, but does everything need to be motor oil that's a stout? I mean, yes. I, I think there's room. Yeah, well, yeah, it does. Jason is known for his motor oil stout, so of course he's going to say yes. But I think there's room for something that's a little bit easier drinking in the stout realm. I think that's... This you're is, you're is incorrect. Beer. You're wrong. Am I wrong? Okay. You're wrong, yeah, so. I, I apologize. I am terribly yeah, wrong. Um, it's okay. Yeah, and uh, I had something from uh, Seminar Brewing. I think it's the first time I've ever had one of their beers. It's the Diaspora Series DS4. has El Dorado Mosaic Hops in it. I love that. It's Where's an IPA. that brewery from? Uh, it's, it's South Carolina, and I forget the exact city. I looked it up okay. because I had no idea. I had never had it before, and it's sneaking around the uh, the state here, and it's, it's extremely good. Okay. Yeah, that's another one that I'm not familiar with, but we're getting bombarded here in Georgia. There's oh, tons yeah. of great stuff yeah. coming in. One that uh, is hitting, yeah, I think it was delayed a little bit, but Fanta Flora out of yes. Asheville is coming here. A lot of people are really looking forward to that, and topical, considering we're talking sour, wild, funky beers sure. with them coming in here. We so. also got Maine coming in. I forgot about that. I had yes, a Maine yeah. beer up in uh, in Blue Ridge. Woods and Waters, just an IPA, one of their many. That was really good, too. Good stuff. Just That's why right. you, you double dipped on Blue yeah, Ridge, did. didn't you? I wound up going so. back up there because uh, a certain somebody apples, was jealous. Right? Apples, Apples yeah. and wildflowers. An apple festival and wildflowers and things like that. Yeah. The missus. Yes. That's Brian gets to get out and play on Saturdays as long as Sundays and Fridays belong to the wife. That's right. right. She calls yeah. the shots, and so if I go up to Blue Ridge, she can tell me the next day we're going to Blue Ridge. I'm like, all right, fine. We're going to Blue Ridge again. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I think it is time for Truck and Taps Beers of the Week, Tim. Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. Woo-hoo! Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, we've got a nice long list of beers to drink this week. I'm going to talk about just a few of them here. So we have a Dre Fontaine and Oud Goose, which is one of my absolute favorites that we're going to enjoy. We have one here from Mr. Jason Pellet of Orpheus. We have your Yester Now that we're going to get into. We have a couple from Sweetwater's Woodlands. We have their 21st anniversary Oud Brune and the Cambium that we mentioned was the medal winner from the U.S. Open Beer Championship. Indeed. We also have some from Boone, Atlanta Brewing, and several other breweries to get into. We'll never make it through them all. This but is it'll no be way. fun trying, Brian. It's going to be amazing to try. Absolutely. Well, Brian, what is happening this week in the news? What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. Well, all right. The uh, the big news making the rounds around the interwebs is the uh, climate change study that came out. Everybody's reporting. It's been a lot of doom and gloom and very scary reporting on that. Well, the Brewers Association just released their response to this uh, climate change study. So the study predicts a lot of beer shortages, increased prices, lower consumptions in, in the latter half of the 21st century, like a 13 to 17 percent drop in barley production by the end of the 21st century. The beer price is doubling by the end of the century and uh, about 900 million gallons less of beer consumed annually in the United States. Wow. So the article from the Brewers Association, which was co-authored by our friend Bart Watson, and he's the economist for the Brewers Association, and Chris Swersey, who's a supply chain analyst, argues that the beer industry is actually well positioned to evolve even as the global climate shifts, and that's a direct quote from them. They say that the, uh, the study is really an academic exercise and it really shouldn't be keeping people awake at night. There could be you know, real challenges with the changing climate in the future. There probably will be, but they point out that the barley cl- crop production geography shifts over time. For example, there's a northern migration in barley growth in North America over the past like 50 to 100 years. But the study in question assumes that geography is constant, but that's clearly not the case. Additional barley crop uh, efficiency has grown over the years, about 1.4% yield increase every year for the past 75 years. So based on historical trends and yield increase
increases. The Brewers Association projects the yields may be as much as 218 percent higher in 2099 when uh, one of the years pointed out by the study than they are today. And finally, breweries large and small are actively investing in research and sustainability projects to address climate change concerns, including research into barley growth cycles and extending them and uh, heat and drought tolerance for both barley and hop crops. So I think everybody needs to take a breath. The beer industry isn't taking this lying down. And according to another story, consumers are also willing to pay more for sustainably produced beers. So neither are the fans taking this lying down. I wonder how much of that is virtue signaling lip service. I also wonder that there's a little bit I if someone asked me if you... No, that's not true. I'd still say no. You know, would you pay more for environmentally sustainable beer? Uh, in all honesty, for me, it just depend on the beer. Is it a good beer? Yeah. And, you know, that was one of the things I wondered, because there is such a thing when you do surveys like that, people can say one thing, and when it comes time to open your wallet, do sure. something else. Absolutely. And I always wonder about that when I see those surveys, and I that mean, was part of that. Interesting stuff. It'd be cool to see how it all plays out. If you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show, we do need to take a break, but we'll be back very soon to talk with Jason and Nick about sour and wild beers. We are Reformation Brewery, celebrating the reformer in you. Locally crafted within the renowned Etowah watershed of Woodstock, Georgia, Reformation creates yeast-forward brews full of aroma and flavor crafted to last. Come see us in beautiful Woodstock, Georgia, for a tour and tasting of unique brews that you can't find anywhere else. Reformation Brewery, set beer free. ReformationBrewery.com beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram next friday is hawaiian shirt day so you know if you want to go ahead and uh wear a hawaiian shirt and jeans now back to the beer guys radio show Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you missed the show, don't worry. All past and future episodes are available on demand. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and never miss an episode. We're at Sweetwater Brewery in Atlanta, Georgia with the folks from ZCon, and we're talking with Nick B. and Jason Pellet about sour and wild beers. So, guys, our goal this episode is to just kind of give an overview primer maybe for those who don't know a lot about sour beers or don't know anything about sour or wild beers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we figured you guys were a couple of the best ones to help us out with that. Probably. So, yeah, wow. absolutely. Yeah, unquestionably. Flattered. And as a matter of fact, we just opened uh, one from you, Jason. Even the Furies wept. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about this beer? So this, is, this beer goes back to actually the first day we started filling barrels shortly, just a couple months after we opened in 2014. Um, so this is a blend of what we called our tribute barrel which is the first five barrels we filled where each barrel got dregs from a different brewery. Um, there was a barrel for Russian River, Cantillon, Dre Fontanen, Phantom, and Jolly Pumpkin. So this got a couple of those, plus some Saltern Barrel, Brett Saison. Those were all, at this point, four years old. And then some younger beer that was only a year old when we blended it. That's, now that you mentioned it, I actually remember seeing the pictures of the bottles inverted yep, in right. the barrels. September, t September 2nd, 2014. Fill them up. Gotta so what do, what do you classify this as? Just like American Wild Ale, or do you have a different category you like um, to think of with that? That's, I mean, 
I don't really call anything American wild ale, but I guess that would be appropriate. Okay. Um, this this has a lot of salt, like uh, saison character, um, in a way. Th- this one has less than a previous blend that had younger barrels. So yeah, I mean wild ale. I don't know what else you'd call it. So you know, Jason, that kind of brings us to really my first question here, or comment for you guys. Sour beers has become a catch-all, or is a catch-all for wild, funky, sour beers. It's just a kind of a blanket term, but maybe doesn't really belong there. Uh, if you were to break that whole category into, say, a few, what do you think kind of the major break points in that world of beers is? Um, I, I, I think for, for us, we, we have some pretty strict internal definitions that don't necessarily line up with what happens elsewhere, but we call a beer just by default. It's sour if there's acid-producing bacteria. Um, if if it actually has... It, so, so a lot of our sour beers have like a house souring culture, but we know it's in that. Um, and a lot of those, like, beer, like our flagship, Atalanta, um, it's boiled after it's soured, and then so we're not going to call it wild, uh, even though the culture is wild. Um, and then beers that actually have mixed cultures that we don't really know what's in it are wild, um, even though, I mean, they're not spontaneous, but we kind of have some idea what's going in because they're cultures that we've used, and then we have spontaneous, or and sometimes we'll call that method traditional. Nick, what's your approach to that? I mean, I'm really kind of... Uh I pretty much call everything that's uh, a mixed fermentation um, an American wild, American wild, to keep it yeah. simple. It's very confusing trying to educate people and doing the Woodlands thing for as long as I have it. Well, not that long, but it's just it's hard educating people, and it's very confusing. Right. So I try and simplify it as, must, as best as I can. I kind of get it into sour, funky, wild, yeah. you know, and uh, some can be wild, like, some can be wild and funky, some can be sour and wild, some can be funky, wild and sour, you know, it's like, um, it's kind of, I think it depends on the, on the beer. That, and that kind of accents, accents the struggle here in the U.S., you know, in Belgium, you've got Lambic, Goose, Oudbrun, you know, Flanders Red, all of these, but in America, it's just, there's this big blanket term wild for everything, West. so, yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, talking about an individual beer is way easier than figuring out what to put on the label. Sure. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that, that's the problem. So, Jason, you mentioned that you were boiling some of those those beers, and so they weren't an actual wild culture. Why, why is that? Why not let the uh, the culture continue to develop? Uh, mainly, I mean, these are canned beers. Okay. Um, just trying to keep part of the brewery clean. So j- just being able to, you know, actually have beers that we can turn around in a couple weeks, uh, put in cans at a reasonable price. I mean, so I had two real ideas of what I wanted to do and open the brewery. One was be able to have really affordable sour beers, which when I kind of started to dream about this brewery six, seven years ago wasn't really a thing. Um, so I wanted to be able to have six packs of sour beer that everybody could drink. Um, and that so that's where the wild wort and then boiled and then clean fermentation came from. And then wanted to be able to have, you know, just a wild barrel program. So, it's, you know, but both sides work for what they are. So that's uh, to kind of... Uh, I don't know if backing it up is the right word as much as just going in a little different direction. To start with something a little simpler. Uh, one category of these sour and wild beers is kettle sours. That's right. Or uh, lacto-soured beers. Mm-hmm. We have uh, Berliner Weiss and Goza. And I know there's been some conflict in the brewing industry about calling them sours. But they are. I mean, they're sour. Oh, they're definitely sour. The taste is sour. Yeah. They're just a different method, a little quicker in that. So well, kind of what's the defining characteristics, Jason, of a Berliner Weiss? Historically, it's way more complicated than generally what you see on a can of beer that says Berliner Weiss, which is, so the, the way it's usually done now um, is you're going to have some wort, you'll pasteurize it, drop the temperature down to around 100 degrees, pitch a lab bought culture of lactobacillus, let it sour for whatever, overnight, a couple days, boil it, and then ferment with a clean German yeast. So that, that's, that's your standard American can Berliner Weiss. Um, Traditionally, there's a lot more wild, lots of Britannomyces involved. Um, You still have 
a few instances of that being brewed, but that's really not what most people are talking about with Berliner Weiss. And a lot of the traditional ones aren't quite as... Uh, some of the American iterations get pretty bracingly sour. Oh, yeah. But like an, uh, an old world traditional Berliner isn't quite that intense, correct? Um, probably not generally. Um, but, you know, they, it's, we, we don't actually know what a lot of them used to be like. Okay. There's, you know, there's the, the record, historical records are pretty incomplete. Kind of sparse because yeah. they knew what they were doing. They knew their equipment and they had the bacteria there. So what do you think about, and I know there's been some debate about it, uh, that some people make Berliners or Gozes or something like that, and they just add lactic acid instead of actually kettle souring. Is it is that legit? Should that be considered I mean, a I, sour? I think they should find another line of work. Okay. <laughs> 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 do what it. do you think, Nick? Yeah. You're over Cheers. there laughing. I'm, I am full. I, I agree. I mean, some people aren't set up to, you know, some people can't tie up the kettle for, you know, that much time. I understand. You just got to find a way around it. We had a similar situation at Sweetwater. Um, we couldn't tie up our kettle for that long, so we just uh, made a fermenter into a, a lacto reactor. Okay. And I, and I won't call anybody out by name here, but there's a brewer that we actually know and like quite well. <laughs> and one of his uh, very most popular beers, it's actually extremely popular, is just, you know, lactic acid added and uh, some you mix, fruit in there. When you mix fruit with it, you can kind of get sure. away with that. Sure. We've tried it. It's just uh, the the mouth feel it's just like really i don't know it's almost like metallic or i don't know it's just like it's a strange mouth feel we you know we looked into it it wasn't really i couldn't do it in okay. good conscience so I mean, to me that's like just dropping vodka into some work yeah. <laughs> instead of fermenting <laughs> drop it in there that's boom there's your alcohol right <laughs> okay now when we move on to the gozes very similar styles but what defines the goza over the berlin Salt, salt and coriander. Salt. There we go. <laughs> Basically, salt and coriander. Is, has it, does it seem to you like the the lines are blurring between Berliners and Gozes? I mean, like they they're both getting a lot of fruit additions and like. Oh yeah, and a lot a lot of the Gozes these days, like the hyper fruited ones. Like I don't even know if there's salt in there. I don't even. It's hard to tell. Yeah, I wonder that myself. I mean, I think I think it's just a hype name. I don't yeah. think it means much anymore. A lot of them aren't even sour. That's true. Yeah. Berliner sour ale, all this stuff. And, but then all you have to do is just throw 40 pounds of fruit in it, and boom, it's a hit. Exactly. Absolutely. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a quick break, but we'll be back in just a minute to talk Z cars and then more sour and wild beers. Looking for a great way to promote your business? Cedar Stream has what you need. For apparel, stickers, signs, and banners, we're your one-stop shop. There are never any art fees or setup fees. And if you need your items quickly, there's no additional charge for rush orders. Whether you own a brewery, bar, bottle shop, or other business, Cedar Stream is ready to serve you. Visit cedarstream.com for more info or call 800-686-7488 for immediate assistance. Cedar Stream. We print. America. It's Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock and Alpharetta are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks daily, so that way you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and coming soon to Duluth in 2018. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You passed out cigarettes for a smoke on on Earth Day. You installed speed bumps on the handicap ramps. And most recently, you dumped 100 pounds of meat on a peaceful vegan protest. Oh, come on. That was way more than 100 pounds. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout-out to our newest radio affiliate, WRMN, 1410 AM in Elgin, Illinois. Catch Beer Guys Radio on WRMN every 
Saturday at noon central. We're broadcasting from Sweetwater Brewery in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're talking wild and sour ales. But before we get back to beer talk, we're going to, you know, get into some information about the Z Car Club Association from the club president, Chris Carl. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us out to your brewery night. Thank you so much. It's we great to be it. part of this uh, during ZCon week. We we do this every year, and we try to go to a very unique brewery. The ZCar community is incredible. We've got folks that love to drink, and uh, Sweetwater's treated us really well today. So ZCon itself, you guys you guys hear of ZCon in the past? Not so much. No, have not. No. So this thing's been running for 31 years. This is our really? 31st annual event and it moves around the country it actually moves around north america it's been in canada twice it's been on west coast east coast southern areas texas florida all over the middle united states as well so we represent about 60 clubs we help organize car clubs around the nissan and Datsun z car lineage bring in all the history the historic racers the designers all the folks that are in the community uh, we bring somewhere between 30 to 40 clubs to z every time we hold it and every year it's in a different spot well wow. Atlanta seems like a good uh, a good place to have it I am not personally a Z car collector but my good friend Kevin Hart is and he's the one that introduced me to uh, the Z car Association and uh, I know that his friends that are into him very passionate people several cars you get one car and you restore it so you can sell it and buy another one is that right is that the oh. rules of the club oh you broke a cardinal rule we don't oh, no. sell oh no. I'm so <laughs> that you never oh. sell no, we oh, collect. Man. Collect, yes. <laughs> if, if life allows, we collect. Keep collecting. Um, okay. I'm up to nine myself. Nine? Right. Yeah, okay. I, have, I have nine nine Z cars from 1970 to the present 370Z, and somehow I'm still married. Okay. That sounds like a good deal then, man. You worked it out there, right? It is. It's worked out so well uh, so far, but I'll tell you what. It becomes a lifestyle type of thing. Sure. Some people have sports. Some people uh, have hobbies like golf. I own clubs. I will never swing a golf club every week. Weekend. It's too much fun to get together with people. We'll drive places, we'll have food, we'll drink great sure. beer like the Sweetwater here. And it's a fantastic social arena around the love for this car. So I'm, I think I'm uniquely qualified to ask this question in that I don't know hardly anything about Z cars. What makes a Z car so special? So a Z car is an everyday man's vehicle or woman's vehicle. You can afford them. You, you they go around corners well. They feel like a cockpit to an airplane. You just enjoy the experience of driving a car. There used to be a slogan called "Enjoy the ride." It was the most successful, in my opinion, most successful message Nissan ever had around these cars in the mid 90s. And the reality is is that when you own a Z car you have a passion for the weekend so you might drive a Maxima and Altima or some other vehicle during the week but you get excited as that week ticks toward Friday about sitting in your two-seater shifting the shifting the stick shift and just your cares about the world go away because it's all about you bonding to the machine and enjoying it and then the destination with your friends un being able to go to a place and just relax socialize and ex it should have that shared experience around the cars. Yeah. It really brings you together. So you said you have nine of them, and I imagine this may be asking you your favorite child, but uh, what's your favorite uh, Z car? Uh, that's a common question I do get, and the uh, favorite one I have is a 1991 800 horsepower twin turbo 300 ZX. She's been with me to now 47 out of the 50 states on road trips around Z events and just adventures, and every memory I have prior to my kids coming along, and even while they were young, I, I still escaped occasionally and had some fun, but it's amazing. Uh, Every, every experience that I had seemed to be in a Z car. I mean, going back to my youth, I got one when I was 16 years old, and when the daily driver broke, I delivered pizzas, right? I would deliver pizzas in the Z car, and the fun, the best part of it, I'd pull in, and people come to the windows going, what the heck? The pizza guy's driving a Porsche. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah the Porsche. <laughs> it wasn't a Porsche. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'm overpaying but, but for pizza. Had, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it had that long, sleek hood. It was attractive, and everybody in the house wanted to drive in, and I'll, I'll be honest, it was easier to uh, pick up.
up a date in a Datsun Z car <laughs> than it was Imagine. a Chevy, <laughs> right? Well, uh, Chris, if people want to hear more about the uh, Z car clubs across the country, their local club, what's the best way for them to do that? So the national organization, the ZCCA, is simple. You go to ZCCA.org. We're a nonprofit firm. Our goal in life is to organize clubs. And our national event is ZCON.org, Z-C-O-N.org. So we do this every year, and there are phenomenal regional events all across the country that our clubs hold. So you can go to ZCCA.org. You can find a club in your local area. You can join up. You can just hang out with these guys and then decide to join later. Dues get you some, you know, they get you some benefits. You get the benefits of uh, discounts at the national event like ZCon. You get the benefits of discounted insurance through places like Haggerty and local parts discounts and whatnot. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks again for having us out here. Enjoy the rest of your time in Atlanta. I'm going to enjoy my time and uh, the rest of the Sweetwater beer. You guys That's do a, a great job. Plan. Hey, thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you much. Cheers. All right, some good Z car information. Let's get back to beer. I like beer. I like Z cars now that I've seen what they are. But uh, let's talk beer. So we've we've opened up an Oud Brune, haven't we, uh, Nick? Tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, this is more like an Oud Brune, almost styled in a uh, Flanders Red sort of category. Um, so basically, the the difference is like Oud what's Brune, this beer? This is uh, this is Curtismo. Curtismo. Okay. Curtismo. Curtismo. This is a, a beer we made for a buddy of ours here at Sweetwater, really close to us. Um, he was all about the, the lawfully uh, cork and cage bottles, and he used to open up with a samurai sword. Um, so As we you kind do. Of like, yeah, sure. so, we, so we wanted to like do something in his memory. And uh, so this is a blend of an oud brune we made also with our cherry PNP that was in Sangiovese Pungeons. And that's Pit and Pendulum for people yeah, who don't sorry. know. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Lots of popping peas there, Brian. Yeah. Popping some peas. Popping some peas. So yeah, this was a this was a blend, and uh, it's kind of blended to be a uh, you know a Flemish red. Um, so that is a good question. Flemish reds and uh, oud bruns very related, but they're they're a little different. It's a little East Coast versus West Coast rivalry. So I read know. something, and it might not be accurate. I read that uh, wood, like it being on wood, made the difference, but I don't know if that's really. You know, it's Wikipedia, so who knows? Is, is that your, uh, your experience? I'm not sure about the Wikipedia version, yeah. but, um, <laughs> I mean, we it saw some wood. Um, we, we treated it with some wood. Um, it was in stainless steel for a while. It was in a fooder. Okay. Um, well, not this one, but another version. But, yeah, I don't really, I don't really think that wood has necessarily makes or breaks the style. Um Get some good wood off of this because it was in uh, bourbon barrels. Oh, okay. Um, Tennessee whiskey and blended with um, Sangiovese pungent. So, yeah, like I said, we kind of took like American uh, and Belgian styles and fused them together a little bit. Um, so, Nick, I may have missed this, but what is the difference in the Oud Brune oh, and like, the Flanders? I'd say like uh, Nude Brune is more like a sour brown and the Flanders red is more like so a red. sour red. So, okay. Um, and I guess, I guess uh, the, the Oud Brune is not supposed to have as much lactic acid and uh, a little less puckering than the, than the red. And I, I have to wonder if, like, Acetobacter is a little bit more of a thing with the red versus the brown, and maybe that's coming from the wood it itself. It is, and it's it's more like uh, oxygen getting introduced into, okay. the, into the process, and that's when Acetobacter is going to form. They, it can't do. That's right. I'd, I'd read about that. It can't do much until the fermentation is done and oxy, oxygen exactly, can get yep. back into the beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nick, thanks for the info. This is a really tasty beer. I'm looking forward to grabbing some more of it. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a quick break, but we'll be back in just a moment to talk more sour and wild beers. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. 
The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing, establishing a new standard in craft beer. Are you thinking about opening a brewery in the Atlanta area? If so, take a look at the Park at Georgetown. This unique community will feature a collection of restaurants as well as a craft brewery within the new JW Homes luxury development, Dunwoody Green. Conveniently located less than half a mile from I-285, this enclave of restaurants will be the gathering place in Dunwoody. Krim & Associates, the developer of the Park at Georgetown, wants to talk to you. For more information, call Todd Semrau at 404-226-6526. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The numbers all go to 11. Does that mean it's louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? Now, back to the Beer Guys radio show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons will get early show access, Beer Guys Radio swag, and some other cool perks. We're broadcasting from ZCon at Sweetwater Brewery, and we're talking wild and sour beer. Jason Palliot. Yes. Orpheus Brewing. I have a question for you, sir. Okay. So we are currently drinking, and you know what? I, I have a friend that used to have a cigar program, and he'd always say the Spanish name's wrong. And I made fun of him, and I said if he's a cigar guy, he should know the Spanish pronunciations. But I feel bad now because I'm doing this, and I struggle with the Dutch, the Belgian beers, and that. To the best of my ability, this is a Dre Fontanen Oud Goose that I'm consuming. Do you know how accurate I am there, or...? I'm not going to correct you. I say Dre Fontenin, and okay. Goose is, if you hear it over there, it's they, yeah. there's sounds in there that I don't necessarily pick up. Yeah. Goose. It's, goose. It's tough. But I, 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 don't, I don't try to fake it. I just say Goose. Joran von Ginterachter. He could probably is, say it better than me. Uh, he tried for several minutes to teach me, and I thought I was saying exactly what he said, no, and he just shook no his way. head and said no. I, I digress, Jason. I have a question mm-hmm. for you, sir. Okay. We would like to talk about Lambic and goose i always want to so what is uh what is the big difference between a lambic and a goose a lambic is it's a beer made in the peyote land around brussels it's it basically takes a lot of the process that we think of in modern brewing and turns it on its head so i'm trying to make a very i say we i don't make lambic i make beer that's lambic process but um so trying to make a very unfermentable work uh, with what's called a turbine mash, which leaves a lot of very difficult to ferment starches, leaves a very milky looking wort instead of what we generally go for with a clear wort. Um, it's a long, hot sparge extracting a lot of tannins from the grain that we usually wouldn't want. Um, long boil, we use aged top, and then the beer goes into a cool ship, which is a flat, shallow, open vessel to collect microbes from the air, and then it goes in the barrels and does its entire fermentation with microbes picked up from the environment. So that's Lambic. So it's a sour, funky um, beer that's spent generally at least a year in barrels. So like, just to clarify, you, you don't pitch any kind of you yeast don't or anything anything in there. So it's going to be whatever wild microbes are around. And to a certain extent between the hops, so the hops, um, beyond c- contributing their very ca- specific specific aged hop character, um, hops have always been used as preservatives. So between the hops that are um, kind of discouraging a lot of the bacteria that we don't want in the beer, um, we're controlling how that fermentation happens um, with the very difficult to ferment wort. We're controlling how the fermentation happens um, in the time of year that it's done, which is generally always colder, controlling what microbes are in the air. Doing a lot to try to control and work with the environment. But yeah, we're not they're not actually pitching any particular microbes. Okay, sure. So th- that reminds me, you're talking about the, the time of the year where you brew. And I, was, I just happened to hear today a weather guy talking 
morning, he was speculating that this winter coming up was going to be much colder than usual and much, much more precipitation than usual. What does that mean for, like, the collection of bacteria or the pre preparation for the process? We, it, that's really hard to say for us. I mean, we've been doing this will be um, our fifth cool ship season this year. So we actually this year just about to put out our um, our blend of one, two, and three year old lambic style lambic process beer, um, which is yes earlier what a goose difference between lambic and goose is a goose is usually a blend of one, two, and three year old lambic. So we don't call ours goose; we call it method traditional three year. So, but we don't have a lot of um, variables to analyze yet to see like what, how the specific weather events affect our spontaneous fermentation. So kind of some variants on the, the goose and lambic. We have uh, creeks, frambois, there's a farrow, which I think is probably more direct, and a, a farrow is just a back sweetened lambic. Is that correct? Generally, yeah, yes. Um, they, there's, you see, uh, I just saw this recently, an oud farrow. And oud, if you see oud on a lambic label, that always means it's not sweetened. Okay. So or, all, all the sugars are allowed to ferment out. So an oud farrow, they would uh, put this, um, the, the farrow is like a, a darkened sugar. I don't know the exact process. It's like a actually. Belgian candy sugar that's been like uh, roasted actually, or something? Or? Yeah, there, there's some caramelization involved. I don't, I, I can't speak to it very well. I've never actually been a farrow fan, um, but I've never had an oud farrow. But I did just see, I forget, Timmermans or something put out an Oud Faro recently. So who knows? I may try it. Interesting. But yeah, Oud, Oud will always tell you that this is not a back sweetened prod, prod beer like those Lindemans, you know, that people, the people that don't really get into Lambic are what, is, who, what they associate with Lambic. So when we look at beers like the Creek and the Fram Frambois, are those ones that just have a secondary fermentation? either creek on cherries or frambois raspberries or is there more to it than that uh, no that's generally it um like like i said with the the more famous like lindemans they get back sweetened after the fruit fermentation i mean that's not the beers that i like to think about with lambic or that we do we don't do anything like that but right, I mean, so it's generally going to be somewhere between one and two year old lambic re-fermented on fruit. Uh, Jason, a question for you. And uh, we've used up a lot of our time today. We've had some great conversation. There's never enough time. An hour goes by so fast. But I do want to talk a little bit about uh, method traditionnel mm -hmm. and uh, method goose, backing up to that a little right. bit. So Jester King Brewery did a beer in the traditional goose style. And uh, they called it Method Goose. And that was under uh, conversations with... So uh, they never actually released it as Method Goose. Did that not? So okay. they... Right. Um, Jeffrey had been working with Jean Van Roy from Cantillon to come up with an acceptable name, style name for that, for a beer made outside of the Peyotin land. Um, and Jean Van Roy had agreed to Method Goose as appropriate. Um, but... Jeffrey had only been talking to him when it got out to Horrell, which is the group of Lambic brewers in Belgium. It's basically every Lambic brewer that's not Cantillon. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Horrell had a problem with it. Pushed right. back very hard. Um, so ended up settling on method traditional, basically taken from the champagne. Um, so if you try to make champagne outside of Champagne, France, you don't call it champagne. You call it method traditional. Um, so this is the same idea, and then uh, for the goose, like the one, two, three year blend, um, MT33. MT3. MT3, yes. right? So, yeah. and they actually have a, a designation. You have to affirm that you'll follow the guidelines. Right. And then you can use a method traditionnel or MT3. You can right. use the marks on there. And uh, uh, Horrell, as you mentioned, they're a very strict set of rules for what makes a Lambert or goose, correct? Um, uh, for them, it's mainly where it's made. Where? So they, they have a lot of... Cantillon and Horrell have been at odds in a lot of instances for um, things that Horrell allows that Cantillon considers untraditional, like the back sweetening that we were talking about a second ago. Um, that's something that Cantillon is very against. It's untraditional. Um, 
and and then like a lot of um, other industrial processes that happen in a few of the oral lambic breweries. So Cantillon isn't everything. You know, we're sure. drinking Dree Fontenin right now. Dree Fontenin's right. part of oral. And my personal preference when it comes to Udgu is I really love the Dree Fontenin. So. You know, one of the things that I think we need to touch on just at least briefly is the American Wild Ale. And, and I'm wondering, it seems like it's such a, a kind of a catch-all for anything. Do you think it's coalescing into a style? Is there an American Wild Style that's kind of coalescing around that? Or is it still kind of just a grab? I think it's a big grab bag. If anything, I mean, it, was, it used to be, I feel like, very defined by very aggressively sour beers. Yeah. And fortunately, I think it's less homogenous than it used to be. Um, I mean, there's a lot of room for subtlety in these beers, and I think we are actually seeing that now. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we we had to rush there a little bit at, at the end because there's so much we wanted to cover, and we had great conversation. Once again, we have Nick Burgoyne from Sweetwater's Woodlands. He is the lead brewer and blender there. We have Jason Pellet of Orpheus Brewing, president and brewmaster. You guys, we really appreciate you joining us. We can share your info and your beers. Yeah, thanks appreciate for having it. us. Thank yeah, thanks much. for having me. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Coming up next week, we're going to be talking with Upland Brewing Company. For more craft beer info, make sure to follow us on social media. We're Beer Guys Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make sure to never miss an episode. Subscribe to Beer Guys Radio on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast, or your favorite podcasting app. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great week, and don't forget to drink local. Cheers. The Beer Guys Radio Show on the Beer Guys Radio Network. BeerGuysRadio.com Welcome to this special extra extended segment of the Beer Guys Radio Show, something we occasionally call the fifth segment. Fifth segment. Because sometimes, uh, Brian, these shows just don't fit in an hour. You get this one for free. So we th- we do. This is this is a bonus. This <laughs> extra is extra booze up commentary. Free. This is for free. So we just had some more stuff we wanted to talk about and some more beers that we wanted to drink with Jason Pellet and Nick be here. So we said let's let's go. Let's just roll, Brian. Let's just roll. And that. Brian, you poured us a beer, another one from from Orpheus here. What are we, si- Jason? What are we sipping on? Yes, yeah, this is everything lasts forever. This is our blend of one, two, and three year old. Uh, method traditional spontaneous cool shit beer i just noticed you actually have the logo oh, so you adhere have, have you've been logo. approved Great. and and uh, adhere to all of the method traditional we adhere to it we have from the beginning do you think that will get adopted more from american brewers or um, are you seeing more adopting it they, um that's hard to say yeah i mean there's You know, not all of our spontaneous stuff is method traditional. I could definitely... I actually debated using that. It was really... I mean, all of our stuff from the beginning, the whole point was to be very traditional. So it all did adhere to traditional process. But um, for a long time, I didn't think I wanted to use it because, I mean, it came about after we started. And... I don't know. There was a lot of politics around it. It was yes. really when I was trying to figure out what to put on the label and how to describe the beer. I was like, man, I just don't like what. How do I describe this beer that's not like four paragraphs? And so I was like, okay, I'll put the MT3. You logo can't even on do there. that on your beer names, much less. I was going to say you have so. done that <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah, so. that's it, it's it's hard for me to stay. You know, you know, brevity is great unless. There's some art and length. So to, to back up the MT3 designation that you use on this beer means it is a blend of one to three-year-old Lambics, correct? Lambic style. Uh, Arcs, Lambic uh, method. process. See? Method. Yeah, sorry. Right. Sorry. So we got to be careful. Gotta be, I have to be careful here. We're going to have Horrell standing out in the parking lot with I clubs. Know. And this is, I mean, this there, isn't right. a legal thing. This is a cultural thing. Sure. Um, but, it's you know, I respect that. I mean, I go to Belgium every year, almost every year. It's like, I mean, that is like the heart of my brewery. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to call the beer Lambic. Sure. You know, they don't want us to call it Lambic. So I one question I had, and I think that either of you guys could probably answer it. Nick, maybe even more so. 
one of the requirements of the method traditionnel is the uh, the ABV be between four and seven and a half percent. And I was curious because I'd never thought of this before. How high of an ABV can you really get out of a spontaneous beer? Is that kind of just there as a catch-all because that's all that's ever been recorded, or can can the the, the bacteria in the wild yeast actually take it up above seven and a half percent? I mean, I think I think it'll ferment anything really kind of depends on your og right how many sugars are in there for it to eat i mean, I mean probably i mean we, we we've isolated some wild yeast in the brewery that we've fermented 11 plus percent beers really with. pretty oh, sure okay. that i mean wild yeast is gonna ferment anything because like, i thought i'd read somewhere that a lot of these were less they were less alcohol resistant and they weren't as efficient at it because they hadn't been kind of trained up, coached up, and yeah. harvested that That's way. That's pretty typical with like a lot of yeast strains that, you know, you, you can, you know, uh, train them in a way. Um, you know, there's like hop tolerant lacto. Sure. That's, you know, it's, it's crazy. Ellen and, Lager uh, used to have been trained and cultured over the years yeah. to each time you use them you, you harvest the ones that are the that's an the strongest in that and then move them on to the next generation right? question yeah. yeah but but we've done a lot of wild stuff that there, there's never we've never tried to do a 10 plus percent spontaneous fermentation but just based on how we, we have done some higher ABV stuff and no problem and it dries out I would love to see an Imperial Lambic or Method Traditionnel. I'd love to see an Imperial Method Traditionnel because I'm I get, it doesn't even it doesn't even match. I still want to see that style together in that ABV just to see what it's like. An Imperial well, with American stout, Wild with a stout. Ale. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, we have so. I mean, one of the beers we put out this year and it was a blend of like Method Traditional barrels with some wild barrels that was mainly like it actually was mainly native wild stuff. Uh, that ended up close to 11%. Yeah, I don't it's see Jake. why it wouldn't, but it depends on the wild yeast and, you know, whatever that what, particular, the, you know, what yeah. you caught, you know. I mean, if you think about, um, there is, there's a lot of wine, especially there's a resurgence of this wine fermented with just the yeast on the grapes. And, I mean, that's not lower ABV wine than other wine. So you're talking, you know. 11 to 15 percent and that's just wild given the juice they'll eat it brian mm-hmm. i had no idea that was a thing just so there's, a, up. there's spontaneous wine out there as well oh, yeah. i actually thought all wine it's it, it's fairly traditional to let it just ferment off what's in there uh, right? it's traditional but it's fairly uncommon is it they don't, uh, they don't, so like, they don't for, like what we like for, i know <laughs> nothing about wine for yeah. decades i mean a long time ago yeah that would have been the case uh, more recently, that's the case in a, you know, just general cultural interest in fermentation. But for decades, it was all very um, kill off the wild yeasts, pitch a, pitch a specific wine yeast, and then let it go like that. But yeah, now th- there are more, none, none of the big wineries are doing their big brands wild, but there is a lot of wild fermented wines out there now do they offer any sour wines like we is there is there a lambic or goose version of wine i mean, there i think it's called uh boone's farm Saint, no uh, <laughs> Saint Saint lambinus <laughs> yeah it's about uh, the well, closest okay. Saint I, mean, so yeah. Yeah. I mean so you have your, your beer sour beer wine is hybrids it? which we've done a few of but you have like a lot of like French Pinots, pretty funky, like lots of Brett character. Uh, I mean, wine already has a lot of acid from the grapes, so you don't necessarily need a bacteria in there creating more acid. And that's really not the big thing that's happening. Um, I think largely because there's already so much acid, you're not going to get significant additional acid production. Okay. They don't like the dry but you can get funk. bread, you know, like, I, you know. A dry bready wine. I think I, I think I'm, man, yeah, I think I like Brett wine that they don't like. I'll take it. Oh, gladly. it's so, I love that <laughs> stuff. And then, and like Spanish ciders, and you know, cider can be looked at as wine. And I didn't think I liked cider until I had some of these funky, super dry, Brett acidic, ones that they're doing now. Yeah. I mean, just wild, 
wines, and yeah, I think there there may be some. I'm sure there's some bacteria involved, but lots of Brett. And you drink some of these Spanish ciders, it's like, it almost tastes like lambic. Yeah, I definitely noticed that. So, what does the wine community as a whole think of wild wines? Is it accepted, frowned How upon? The hell, would so, I know? See, <laughs> yeah, not, uh, it's still <laughs> like the, the community as community. a whole. I think is still not really on it. Like, there's yeah. smaller parts of the community that really embracing it but Probably it's very a, it's very neat i think it's more niche than sour beer and beer even well i mean probably the same thing like we talked about when cantillon and the sour beers came into the u.s you know the dan shelton talked to us last year just before shelton fest and he said when i brought cantillon here i knew it was a great beer but i had stores calling me and sending it back and saying something's wrong with this you know this isn't right and i mean he, we struggled with he that for a to year it. yeah Sure. I think I'm like that. I don't know, around 2010. Yeah. Era, you know, like the tides kind of turn, and like especially when, you know, we couldn't get it here anymore. Um, I don't know. That made me want it more. That yeah. did, that when the Sheldon did brothers yeah. pulled out of Georgia, and like for uh, whatever reason, and Westy. But but, you know, then, so there is a very in Atlanta. There's always been a very strong core of beer drinkers you know supported like the brick store for many years and the porter um but beyond that core that really wasn't huge you know sour beer was not a thing like when when we opened in may 2014 i mean it took a good 18 plus months for to just stop getting just kegs regularly sent back to us because they were sour you're like, well, it's like, a sour it, it beer. Literally, it says so. it on the label. It, it says yeah. it on the label. And the, the buyers would come. They would drink the beer at Orpheus, love it. They would buy it. They didn't know how to sell it. And so it would be on their menus. It's just like Orpheus, Atalanta, plum beer. And so people would order right. it and be like, something wrong with this beer. Because they, they weren't even told it was sour. So, yeah, I mean, it was a huge lear- learning curve and for the whole industry when it started to go more... I may hate to say this about us, but it's mass market sour to a small degree. We don't sell that so much. So mainstream. But. Jason Pellet, the mainstream sellout. Hey, I mean, I did my goal up front was to make an affordable sour that everybody could buy. Sure. Yeah, and and because that's what I was. You know, honestly, with. Jason, stuff like that that is accessible and is not a twenty dollar bottle of Cantillon or something like that is going to get more people to try it. And maybe experiment. Now, I'll, I'll admit, I've shared some of your beers with friends who are not, and they're like, oh, my gosh, what is wrong with that beer? You know, I'm like, that's fantastic. That's- you know, there's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, some people, if you if you are a macro drinker or, or even if you just drink Pilsners or, or Pale Ales and that's been your total exposure to the craft beer world, and I break out a Cascade. I think you were at my house, Brian, when I had uh, our buddy Vic that moved to Denver. Him and his wife were over. Yeah. Yeah. And we shared a cascade, and they're like, oh, my gosh. They're like, do people actually like this? I'm like, people love this. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, pe- people love acid. People, the, sure. The kids first time love I, sour candy. Warheads, sure. salt and vinegar Grew up chips. on that. Grew up sure. on that stuff. The first time I ever went to Cascade, I went there, and I wasn't sure I enjoyed it, but I tried everything at the, at the barrel house, and I'm like, I don't know what I think about this. Now, I mean, we had a cascade blueberry earlier i thought it was wonderful i mean the me now is not the same as me back in 2010 so there's definitely been a shift in tastes i mean i mean think about what i'm doing working at like a traditionally hoppy brewery right and trying to get our clientele to turn on to you know um you know a little bit something different it's, it's been a challenge, but you know, I'll when you've got it. your your 420 and blue and IPA drinkers, I mean, that's like what you know, that's what right. people think. And you know, the Woodlands is like tried to brand it a little bit separately as the Woodlands, right? Yeah, you know, but that's also like nobody knows what it is. So, Actually, you know. can I ask how you got involved with that? Because like for me, it's like well, I there's the the side of opening the brewery that's tough just to get a brewery open once i have a brewery open i'm the one that decides who works with a wild beer and that's me yeah, um, <laughs> yeah well so um, how does sweetwater obviously has i think anybody won in that position well um i think he I've just been, dissed you i'm I've not been, sure no, no 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 <laughs> i'm saying i don't know 
Well, I've been working with Sweet Honor for like 12 years and started like on the bottling line and was shippering for like 10 years, messing around with like sour, wild. So you're just home beers. brewing that stuff? Um, I mean, if you can call it that on a production oh, but doing Oh, you were doing the stuff here. I was doing it here, oh, but like on the been, side. This, like, this, is a, this is an Atlanta secret in the industry because Sweetwater never sold this stuff. But the wild stuff done at Sweetwater for like industry and some festivals has always been great. We did want we did want a, a medal at uh at the uh you did for campium yeah well i was gonna say we actually won a gold medal or silver medal i think in the uh in the sour category the world beer cup in like 2009 or something like before way before oh what way was, back what was that but anyway for? getting back uh that was for the cre- the sour creeper i don't know if i, I don't know if uh, i remember yeah. that. heard of the sour yeah. creeper I, I, I think I, I had that here many years the ago. The medal's and downstairs. Like some, you can go look at it. Okay. Some right. festival, some But random. anyway, back, Jason, back to your <laughs> thing. Um, so We're shift all over the place. For 10 years, <laughs> and I'd always, like, had a passion for that on the side. You can imagine brewing beer for 10 years. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you might want to do something a little outside the box, and, uh, you know, I'd kept at it and finally convinced them that this was something that uh, was worthwhile and uh, so yeah now I'm there and no that's awesome I mean the beer is great I just I, I never I know like, it, it could have been something I think it was somebody up, up high they could have decided we need because they have the money to do this like we need a sour facility or just gonna hire somebody outside to do no, it I've been here the whole time and uh, I love it that's been good. a long been along for the ride for a while and Sweetwater's good about doing that aren't they Nick I Mo- mean moving people up I, I mean, mean I, I like I said I started volunteering at the brewery when I was yeah. 21 and then worked on the packaging line went to be a brewer and now I'm doing this and I'm you know learning a lot along the way and uh, you know inspired by like what's going on just like you you know um, and that may be a lot of uh, Sweetwater's uh, ability and desire to train people up from the inside may be part of the reason they're kind of a stepping stone or they're part of the fa- they're the core the roots of the family we family tree definitely we could go yeah. so many another thing about this because but, even looking at yeah. the woodlands uh chris meadows right is now brewmaster at elkmont exchange right uh, up in knoxville tennessee we were we were partnering yeah. doing that together and then he left so yeah and troy and montrone I, I took it up yeah and now he's now crooked, crooked state. state we're going to talk to them in a couple weeks actually. yes we are so yeah yeah you know one of the things i wanted to get to and we we didn't have time for it earlier was uh blending is a big part of what you do nick and Absolutely. and honestly what i don't know what what's your approach to that i don't know how you do that it's i'm curious about that i mean we'll just you know we'll, we're gonna we're gonna have a concept in mind and then you know we're we're gonna kind of figure out where we are and where we want to be and then just work it out and do you, I mean, do you have a, like a panel that comes together and tastes it and says, "Hey, you know this and this"? There's, and yeah, there's a there's a few of us here at the brewery that all, um, you know, have uh, like you know, good palates and uh, a mind for this sort of thing. It's definitely not something that uh, I don't want to sound like. You know, um, it's not something everybody can do. It's not something everybody can do. Sure, and like yeah. you know. We've got a vision, and then, you know, we kind of work out that vision. Um, and it's, like, it's really not that big of a deal. Do it's you, like we just we will sit around and we'll sip on some barrels. Like, oh, that'd be good with that. Taste, yeah. This would be good with that. It's it's not that big of a deal. Now, but Jason, you actually did something cool with a blending session recently. I sure did. did. You you invited some commoners in there, right? I did. I <laughs> we mean, do you that pay, too. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was fun. That was. I mean, you know, we've done some stuff where we invite some industry people in for blending sessions just to get some additional palettes involved. But this was. Um, I mean, it was September second. It was the day that. It was the fourth anniversary when we started barrel aging. Okay. It was like, okay, we're going to do a blend today. And um, just pulled like 18 or 20 barrel samples from assorted things. Just figured out, it was like, th- th- this could be as big as small of a blend as we came up with. And 
you know, it was an all day thing, just um, tasting through, you know, let, letting people, think, you know, see like how we approach each barrel to figure out what it might contribute to a blend. You know, we're looking for acid, barrel, like wood character, hops, fruit, um, just kind of overall character and then figuring out like what what might each contribute to a blend and just go from there like figure out okay from everything we tasted there's some obvious things that you can just say that's not going to be part of it but then like okay so what then there's then there's always obviously some great stuff we're like we're gonna build a blend around this barrel or like these two barrels that are similar um, and then, like, so what's it missing? And just build from there. So, yes, yeah, so it was fun to bring a whole group of people in for that. And that Probably beer, per, pretty educational for those that have never done anything like that, kind of see how a beer comes together in the blending process. I think so. And especially, and it was fun. You know, we don't always run into something like this. We, but we had um, one particular barrel that everybody loved. Um, so we started with that one as the core. And then it was like, okay, well, there was a one other barrel that was pretty unanimously really liked and says okay what happens if we combine those and somehow th- there is no off flavors in either barrel individually but we combine them as like that's a butyric acid bomb it's like there is no detectable butyric acid in either and it's you know it comes together and then so everybody there sees like this is not just like just take a lot of barrels put them all together and oh, yeah. call it and a beer. See it's you like get, yeah. every single no, part of the blend be. has to come together. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain too. It's like it is. You just got to taste. Can't, exactly. You can't explain. You just have to taste. Exactly. Yeah. It, it all comes together as trite as that sounds. But like you know, it's it's true. That's. I mean, that's, that's we we don't really approach. I mean, obviously, we have lots of barrels that were brewed at the same time, but very rarely do we approach it like these barrels are brewed together so they're going to be bottled together it's just every single barrel is its own thing very individual so getting back to the whole method tradition uh, tradition now or the the whole Mm -hmm. method goose you know the lambic inspired things i was looking around and it it turns out there's a number of different interesting methods that don't involve cool ships to to create lambic style beers are i mean are you familiar with these uh, uh, d- is this a joke no uh, seriously it's uh, there's one called the libau method i think that i'm saying it's right libu libu, libu. and uh is that french Lib- i think dutch could be but it's one of those things mort sabites i don't know if i'm uh, saying see, it this is this would be one of those things oh mort to so that's now abn bev Oh, I did not know that. So one of the things that they were doing was, uh, and there's two different, there's there are two different methods. There's the DKZ and Bellevue does that, and Mort Sabit does something called the Lebeau method. Both of them involve chilling uh, the 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 wort. Uh, one's a plate chilled, and the other one's a heat exchanger chilled. And both of them involve inoculating tanks or pipes with with uh, unsterilized air. Uh, they you, fill the tanks with the local air, right? Yeah, one of them fills the tanks with the local air. Another one, I think, actually pumps sort of a, it through the wart, right? Yeah, compressed air that goes through the wart. That? Have you guys ever heard of that? And have yeah, you so ever this, tried anything like that? These are the kinds of we. Um, so these are the kinds of things that makes Cantillon not a member of Oral. <laughs> Oral is okay with that. Cantillon's not. Because that seems um, like the antithesis of tradition. You know what I mean? It really is, and it's, it doesn't mean you can't make good beer. Though the Mort Subit that I had, um, I generally would never buy an AB and Bev beer. I was in uh, the Netherlands earlier this year, and just in a in a bar in Tilburg, I think, um, and asked for a sour beer, and they gave me like Mort Subit's new goose, is what they called it. Um, so I was like, okay, fine. Drank it. It was terrible. I brought it outside <laughs> to my wife, who's a big sour fan. And I gave it to her without telling her what it was. And she was like, what is this? BB, BB, swear words, right? <laughs> you gave me. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's ABN Beth Goose. Okay. All right, I didn't realize that that was the case because it, it seemed like it was interesting that they these different 
breweries had done away with the cool ship concept to, pu- to basically pipe in air. I mean, that that's the industrial stuff that Cantillon okay. is very against. All right. Yeah. Well, guys, we're, I think we're going to wrap up this little extra segment here. One parting question for you. Jason, green bottles, yes or no? You know, I, it depends on the beer a lot. Um, I actually love the flavor of, like, um, Avec Le Bon Vu and green bottles. I don't know if you recall this, but uh, the grand opening of your brewery, you had posted on Reddit that we both frequent and looking for bottles of that. Mm-hmm. And I said, I think I have some, I have some of these, but I think they're skunked. And oh, you're yeah. like, I'm cool with that. Bring it on. <laughs> I so, love it. Yeah. Yes. So, like, there's some combination of funk and skunk that I really like. Okay. We haven't done green bottles. Um, I appreciate, um, like, Jester King's done, like, the same Saison and brown and green bottles. That's um, cool. Uh, we just, you know, that's just one of those things that's cool. We just haven't done it. Nick, green bottles. Absolutely. We actually right. do green bottles for our Woodland Circle for anything That's that we want, light strength, you know, flavor. Yeah. I dig it. Um, I think it's awesome. Because it can manifest in certain beers like these gooses and that that we're talking about. Not so much as a skunk. I think it's like really going to make it but better. A, a nice funkiness to it. So. For a saison or something, like I think it's, uh, it's perfect. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I would actually recommend... To skunk, skunk it up a little bit. Skunk those uh, those green bottles if you have a Woodland Circle membership. And check them out. Okay, Because cool. I was blown away myself. Guys, thanks again for joining us and, and staying around extra long to talk a little bit more. We've really enjoyed chatting and drinking these sour and wild and funky and crazy beers with you. This is Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt and audio engineer Sam Kempe, who has stayed quiet but keeps Thanks, us Sam. going over there. Sam, you're the man. You're the Keeping man. Real. This is Beer Guys Radio. This is our fifth segment extra. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers. <laughs>